Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as we continue to worship the Lord, we invite you to sing along with us. Uh, Brother Yong Yo has sent you the link, and if you could follow along and sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, we need you. Let's sing together as we open up this worship service. Join us. Friends, we know that more than ever uh, in this season of coronavirus, just affecting every arena of our lives, we need the Lord more than ever. So thank you for joining us for worship as we transition into a time of prayer. Just wanted to bring up uh, three major issues. First, around the world. Um, we've been hearing news and following updates on uh, how the coronavirus has affected uh, really every region of uh, the world. In North America, South America, the pandemic crisis has just escalated out of control and people are panicking and uh, we are extremely concerned. Many people are asking whether this is a judgment of God. Well, we know that Bible teaches us that God is God of love and uh, God of mercy. And he is really calling his people to come together to, to uh, seek him and seek his face. So we need to um, come together to pray. And uh, the other thing is, um, as we uh, think about how SNU has been affected by the uh, crisis, Every one of you have been affected as well. So let's pray for SNU and also all the uh, students on campus as well, all the professors and staff, etc. And we know that we all have prayer concerns that only God knows about. And we want to spend some time just looking over some of our prayer requests and, and uh, come together in prayer. So please join us. Uh, for a time of prayer, and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for granting us this permission to come into your throne room of grace and mercy. Father, we know that pandemic crisis has just gripped every arena of our lives, and our life as we know of it have been changed and affected by this uh, invisible virus. And Father, we also know that you are reigning king over every situation, including the coronavirus crisis. Father, we know that when Jesus uh, came to be with us 2,000 years ago, he calmed the wind and calmed the sea. And people marveled how the nature and, and natural situations like this even obeyed him. So we surrender this pandemic situation uh, to you, reign over this situation, and we pray that you would arrest this crisis and bring normalcy uh, to, to our life. Father, we need you more than ever, so we humbly come before you to ask that you would give wisdom and grace to people in the uh, medical field and um, all the people working at hospitals in order to to really tackle the situation, we ask that you would help them in, in the uh, field of medicine. Also, Father, be with families of those who have been affected by coronavirus, and we ask that you would engage yourself in such a way to bring about healing speedily. Father, we know that you are with us, even in this time of trouble, and our you, uh, your help for in our situation is ever increasing and we humbly come before you and surrender ourselves completely to you. We ask that you would help us to know that uh, you're in control. And Father, we, we know that you are God who is quick to listen to our prayers and come to, our, uh, come to be with us in, in this time of trouble and season of crisis. So, Father, we ask that you would make yourself become real, um, that you are Emmanuel God, who is going through this situation with us. 
Father, we also know, even though we may not have a full understanding of what good purposes could come out of this, but we know that you are reigning over this situation and you are going to bring about good and eternal purposes and accomplish good things that you have planned. So, Father, we ask that you would uh, bring all the things together to, to bring about the ultimate good as we surrender ourselves and learn and, and uh, continue to seek you and obey you. And Father, millions and millions of people around the world are uh, hopelessly lost. And there are places around the world that they do not have medical assistance and uh, medical help. And we ask that you would, you would help them in this urgent crisis. And Father, we also ask that you would empower your church, uh, the Bride of Christ, to become visible and active, engaging, in order to bring about uh, need, much needed relief and healing in this situation. Father, we ask you to empower your church, to raise up your church, so that we could become the visible manifestation and also the representative of the good news of gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we, as we turn our attention to SNU, Father, we pray that you would be with professors and all the staff and protect this school. Father, you know that thousands and thousands of students are studying in order to become useful members of this society, and we ask that you would help the professors and all the students. Especially, Father, we pray for international students who are uh, here in Korea, getting adjusted to a strange culture and strange language and people that are not familiar to them. So, Father, we ask that you would grant them wisdom. And Lord, we know that we, every one of us have um, individual prayer requests that you know about. So, Father, we ask that you would open up the floodgates of heaven and engage yourselves with every single one of one of our members here at uh, SNUIC. And Father, lead, lead us and guide us and guide our steps in such a way that we would grow in the knowledge of who you are and we would learn how to depend on you all the more and look to you, not on circumstances, but focus our attention on you and you alone. So may your plans and will be accomplished in us and through us. And Father, once again, we thank you for granting us this opportunity to come together to worship and pray. And we ask that you would help us to worship you in the spirit and in truth. In Jesus' precious name, we surrender this prayer. Amen. Well, thank you for uh, interceding with us. And as we turn our attention to um, the passage for today, you know that we have started a new passage, the book of Ephesians, as many of you are meditating and reflecting on these passages. And over this weekend, uh, we meditated on this passage portion that, um, at, uh, at eye gathering. And if you could go back and, and take uh, start reading from verse 11 of chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians, that would be great. So let's take it from Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at the time, you are separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. 
for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is the Word of God. On Thursday evening, many of you join online uh, to participate in the 2020 Veritas Forum with Dr. John Lennox from England. Many raise the question, where is God in the coronavirus world? And Dr. Lennox provided biblical suggestions to questions like, how can Christians live faithfully in the middle of this unavoidable fear and uncertainty caused by the coronavirus? Is, God's, is this God's judgment? Is God unable or unwilling to stop this crisis? There are many, many questions raised by people who participated uh, before and after. We know these are very difficult questions, and yes, we are indeed living in a, a scary and a time of uncertainty. Yet he reminded us that God identifies with us and joins in our suffering. He doesn't stay away, stand aloof from our suffering and pain, but he actually joins because this is really the central concept of Christianity and the core idea of Christianity, that God who does not leave humanity in pain and suffering, but he actually came and joined us by uh, sending his one and only son, Jesus, the son of God, who took up the cross and became part of the human suffering that's the heart of the Christianity. And no other religions can claim or even come close to this central concept or teaching of Christianity. As I was preparing for today's message, I just wanted to focus on this question. Not how can we live, but how do we live? How do we live as Christ followers, as Christians, as sons and daughters of God? live in corona pandemic world? Is Christianity or being a Christian just a life of theoretical ideals or following religious rules and regulations or a life lived out in the middle of pain in spite of problems, in spite of troubles and tribulations as Christ in me, Christ for me, disciples of Jesus? If we were to ask the question like religious people do, um, or raise uh, biblical questions uh, were to be uh, asked of us, we probably wouldn't know how to answer them correctly. We know the theological answers. We know the doctrines. We know how to answer biblically. But Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice. Wow, this is a very sharp and poignant word that really penetrates deep into our soul. Because many of, many of uh, people today, I believe, do call Jesus' name. And we do call him uh, Lord and Lord. And yet, we do not put into practice what he is teaching us and and commanded us how to live. And you remember in the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, John, and James were together with Jesus and heaven opened up and Jesus walked among them and, and um, they saw a vision of Abraham and Isaiah and all the prophets and, and Jesus just dialoguing. And then a voice came from heaven. This is my son whom I have chosen and he doesn't say, love him or just worship him. But God says, listen to him. Listen to what he has to say and obey. Put into practice what he says. So I want to remind all of us, we need to put into practice what we know to be true. Because Christianity is based not on theory or religious concepts, 
but on truth, truth of Jesus. So we need to put into practice what we know to be true and not allow our feelings or circumstances to gain the upper hand uh, in, in, and cause us to forget that we are indeed Christ followers living in this confusing coronavirus affected pandemic world. So from the passage we read today, we are told to first, remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. Because we have been saved by grace, uh, by faith. And number two, practice doing life in the presence of the Father. We need to know that He is with us. He's here. He's with us. He's doing and, and actually very much interested and involved and engaged in, in the affairs of our life on a daily basis. So we need to practice doing life in his presence as if he were with us because he is with us. And third, we need to be the church for such time as this. We have to be the church. There is no other plan for God. God did not say, well, those of you who want to be the church, you could be the church. Others of you could just go about doing your life as, as uh, it comes and goes. No, he, he wants all of us to be the church. And do you know that our obedience actually allows God to build his church and build up his kingdom? So that's, those are the three things that I want you, all of us to know. First, remember. Second, practice. And third, let's be the church. Okay, so let's go one at a time. Remember, the first part of this passage that we have read, verses 11, verse 11 says, Therefore remember that formerly you are Gentiles by birth, birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. You see, the Gentiles were not included uh, as people of God. And even though Jesus came, people simply did not understand this concept that God, the creator of the universe, wanted everyone to come into his kingdom, to become a family member of, of uh, heavenly realms. But people wanted to separate and divide and, and say, you, you can't be part of us. I believe this kind of division and, and subtle condescension and separation exists even today. And uh, 2,000 years ago, Apostle Paul reminds us to, to the audience in, in the church of Ephesus or in the region of Ephesus, he says, Formerly you were all Gentiles by birth and call the uncircumcised. At the basic level, most of us are not Jewish by birth nor by ethnicity. Most of us were born in countries and nations where the gospel of Jesus Christ was not available by tradition. Not even religiously, we, are, we were connected to Christianity. I want, you, I want to give you a little bit of historical background just on Korea. Many, many people around the world think and believe that Korea is, is a Christian nation, but that is far from being the truth. Just about 130 years ago, 140 years ago, Korea, uh, gospel was not available in Korea. No one knew the name of Jesus. Um, the gospel of Jesus Christ first came uh, in the year 1884 through a Catholic, uh, although Catholic missionaries entered Korea th through China as early as 1758 and 1785, those were just some Catholic missionaries visiting Korea sporadically. And uh, even though seven Catholic missionaries were executed in 18, 1866, Christianity was not presented to the common people in Korea. The more popular understanding of the gospel entrance or gospel presentation to Korea happened in 1885 when Horace Allen a medical doctor in Horace Underwood came to Korea as the first Presbyterian Christian missionaries to establish Christian community in a place called Korea. And they, they would set up schools and hospitals and engage the, the common people. And these are the photographs of both Horace Allen, medical doctor, and Horace Underwood, 
I don't know why they're they're both Horaces, but um, two Horace ca Horaces came to Korea to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. One year earlier, a missionary in Japan, Robert S. Um, McClay, who met the Emperor Gojong in 1884, and he was allowed by Emperor Gojong to allow to set up schools and hospitals before the Methodist missionaries, um, very popular Methodist missionary called named Henry Oppenzeller, came in 1885, and later joined by E. R. Hendricks and C. F. Reed in 1895. These are some of the photographs of the early years and as you can see the Methodist missionaries and Korean leaders. These are uh, and also these are the evidence for thousands of missionaries who followed who came late later to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to Koreans and in fact several hundred of them uh, did not return to their home nations but actually uh, died in Korea and they are currently buried in in foreign missionary cemetery called Yangwajin which is just about 30 minutes up north of SNU and these are some of the images of uh, the early Christian leaders and this is the picture of Yangwajin 221 adults and 133 children including 23 unknown total of 376 uh, tombs, uh, burial ground is, is located in a place called Yangwajin. Remem remembering and reminding us that without their sacrifices, the gospel would not have been presented to Koreans, nor Korea be given the opportunity to receive Christ as personal Lord and Savior. So Apostle Paul reminds the people at Ephesus and also the surrounding churches in, in the region. Remember that, that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in this world. And he reminds us that it is really by gift that we have been given the gospel. Earlier in the chapter, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Apostle Paul says, For it is, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You see, just simply understanding these concepts that God sent his one and only son to die for us on the cross, and anyone who believes in him will be saved, is not enough. If it's a gift, the receiver has to receive the gift. Even though the, the gift giver may present the gift, if the receiver doesn't receive it, then it's of no use. You see, that's why faith is required by the recipient. And we, recognizing the gift from God, we need to simply receive it by faith. By receiving it, that means we understand, we accept it, we appropriate it in, in our lives that the uh, that Jesus is the Christ and he is my lord he is my savior not a theoretical concept but a personal lord and savior korea was entrenched in religious shamanism and confucianism and buddhism when the gospel of jesus christ came to korea and and this entrance to korea was at a ex extremely high price. In fact, hundreds of missionaries died and thousands of have sacrificed and invested their entire lives for the sake of Korean people. And that's why we enjoy uh, being a Christian community now. We are the beneficiaries. So verse 13, Apostle Paul reminds us, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know that the gospel for the gospel and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ to take root and be established and become settled in Korea, it really came at an extremely high price of all the sacrifices and, and even life 
of many, many foreign missionaries. The blood of Jesus Christ was needed for any, anybody like us to have an opportunity to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, the um, uh, book of Hebrews uh, chapter 9 reminds us that for this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. See the laws or the first covenant given to Moses uh, really define for us and, and enable us to identify that we were committing all kinds of sin against God. And yet, uh, all the religious sacrifices could not satisfy the high demand of holiness and perfection that God he himself wanted from all of us. So even though thousands and thousands, in fact hundreds and thousands of animals, animals were sacrificed repeatedly, it really did not do anything for, for humanity until Son of God, Jesus Christ, came. And once and for all, he paid the ransom to set us free. And that's what the Bible says. And this is why it is important for all of us to remember, be intentional, very uh, deliberate in, in choosing to remember what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. He came to live a perfect life that you and I simply could not live. He died a death as a ransom payment and paid the ransom that we owe God that we simply could not pay. And Jesus paid. Not only that, God has given us the Bible to tell us what he is like. And for us to understand what the scripture says, he gave us another gift called the Holy Spirit. So when we read, certain things make sense. And our heart tells us that, that oh yes, that's what happened. I, I get it. I understand what the gospel means and why I need to surrender my life to Christ. Friends, we need to be very deliberate and intentional in wanting to choose God and wanting to remember what God has done for us. And then comes to the second uh, action. Number two, practice doing life in the presence of the Father. You see, the Bible says, he continues in book of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, ver follow along with me from verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Not only between two people groups, but also there was a dividing wall that we couldn't uh, go across with humanity and God. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its demands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. You see that? Uh, he wanted to reconcile both of them to God. The ultimate purpose was to break down the barrier that existed between God and humanity. And he broke them, and, and he reconciled both of them to God through the cross of Jesus Christ, and by which he put to death uh, their hostility. He broke down the barrier between the two, and he allowed us to access um, God. And then, uh, in, in the scripture, we are reminded in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11, he has said everything beautiful in its time. He has also said eternity in the human hearts. Yet no one can fathom what God has done through, uh, done th from beginning to, the, to end. Do you know that God has created us in his image? And one of the evidence for uh, creating us, the fact that God has created us in his image is because we could imagine eternity. We long for eternity. We know that this world is not everything there is. And that's why even in Corona pandemic world, we know that things will be uh, 
be, become arrested and things will return to normalcy and God will reign over even in this situation. You see, every human being has a sense of things and concept like love and righteousness and goodness and faithfulness, loyalty, perfection, truth, and yes, eternity. They're not human inventions, but God's image etched on the hearts of every human beings. And that's why we could imagine love. But can you imagine um, if there was no heartbreak and no hatred? What value or uh, uh, precious um, like credit will we attribute to concepts like love? What would faithfulness be with, without laziness? And what would loyalty be like without people betraying us? See, what would comfort and peace and, and, and righteousness be like without crimes and sins and uh, all the troubles that we see that's uh, prem uh, prom predominant around the world? So he continues, He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Friends, do you know that um, how difficult it would be for you to have make an appointment with the president of SNU? Or let alone department um, dean? It, it, would, it would be not easy, uh, let alone president of your nation, I know that some of you work in the government, but I know even at that level, even at that position, having access to the king or the president of your nation would not be very easy. But do you know that we have actually access to the Father, the Creator, God, who created all of us and created the entire universe? We have access to Him through Jesus Christ and the Bible says the Holy Spirit will help us to gain access. And this is simply astounding. And I, I, don't, I don't understand why he would be interested in listening to what I have to say. But experientially, I know that is true. Because sometimes when I just simply pause and allow my thoughts to stop, and if I were to say, Father... Do you know what I'm feeling right now? May I speak with you? I could, I could sense that I am overwhelmed with his presence. And he, he just locks eyes with me. And he, he would listen to me. He would lean and listen to what I have to say. Um, I know that um, uh, sometimes, you know, when, when I receive a call from my daughter, I would answer, I would be using, hello, uh, my natural voice, but people around my office and people uh, who s saw me answer my daughter's call would say, Pastor David, your voice changes every time you, you answer a call from your daughter. I guess it's because, um, because of my love and affection for her. Perhaps my intonation would, would change and people take notice. And do you know that if a sinful father like me, a sinful human being like me, could have that kind of uh, sensitivity and gentleness in addressing and picking up a call from my daughter, how much with grace and mercy and affection and love our perfect Father in heaven would have, if you were to say, Father, I am... In this situation, would it be possible for you to help? He would be more than willing. And this is what Apostle Paul again writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and following. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You and I are children of God. And that means uh, we are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption as sons and daughtership. 
and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And this word, Abba, is a very tender, very gentle word. English equivalent would be uh, uh, Daddy, or Korean would be Appa. And I know that many of you uh, come from regions where the most gentle and affectionate phrase that or word you would use would be Papa or, or um, uh, Dada or Daddy. And that's what the Bible says. We could call him Abba, Father. The Spirit him, he Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Do you know when you enter into His presence, one of the first senses that, that you will be overwhelmed with would be the sense that you are indeed a child of God Most High. God has given us not only Jesus, His one and only begotten Son, but along with Him, the Holy Spirit. And on top of that, as I have mentioned before, He gave us his word, the scriptures, for us to get to know who God is and what kind of God he is and what kind of plans that he has for us. And there is one more gift that God has given us. And that's why with this gift, we could actually overcome even the coronavirus. And even though we may have uncertainty about the future and all the economists and people in the financial institutions are saying the worst is yet to come, but we know that we are still going to be okay because God has given us the gift of the church. And this is not just building or structure or a place. It's not... Uh, uh, established by bricks and mortars, but he collected a community of people to come together by investing his Holy Spirit in all of us to become the church. And we need to be the church and our obedience has tremendous amount of power. Do you know it has a latent potential to be, be unleashed and change and transform the world that we come in contact with every day if we become the church. Our obedience actually allows God to work in us and through us to affect change and transform the world. So verse 19 and following, take a look at what Apostle Paul says. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We are members of his family, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus, Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. God not just saved us individually, but as a community to become fellow citizens and to be members of his household and to be included in God's people. This is amazing. This is what the Bible says. And yet, yeah, take a look at this built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ himself, Jesus himself, as the chief cornerstone. Friends, the foundation of this church that God is building, the foundations are, um, you know what foundations are, right? When, when the architect and, and construction companies build, build up a, a building, they dig deep into the ground and they lay the foundation down so that the building will stand sturdy and strong. When the wind blows, it wouldn't break. The foundations are usually invisible because they're buried below the ground. They don't take the spotlight. They're not easily seen. And the church that God is building and establishing here says the built on the foundation of the apostles the church leaders who started this, this evangelism process of, of explaining and defining the gospel of Jesus Christ so that normal people like you and me could understand and get it and appropriate that by faith, the grace of God presented to us in Jesus Christ. These were the, 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 the apostles of Jesus Christ and they are buried as a foundation and along with them, all the prophets, all the prophets that we, we hear of in the Old Testament. And then 
we know that Jesus Christ became the chief cornerstone, setting the mark to begin this process. Many of them gave their lives for us to be, be beneficiaries of this gospel of Jesus Christ. And this also reminds us um, a tremendous sort of a concept right side up. It's not reversed because this is God's way of wanting to say, look, those of you who understand the gospel, would it be possible for you to become the foundation so that others could be established on top of you? You see, uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews, he, uh, the, the author lays down and, and ha has a roll call of all the prophets of the past who remain faithful. And, and um, uh, he writes, uh, and let me just re read a portion of this for you. Verse 35 of Hebrews chapter 9. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went on about in sheepskins and goatskins and destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Wow, what a life. In verse 38, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the desert and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what has been promised Jesus Christ, that you and I have, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us they would be made perfect. Do you know that the gospel that we, you and I possess is something that all these, these great and faithful men and women of God long for? They, they waited their entire life. And Apostle Paul continues on by saying, in verse 21, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is not an upside down description. Rather, this is right side up hierarchy in the kingdom of God. That the leaders serve the followers in the church. The people who have the educated, the, the people who have been entrusted with resources, the learned and educated and experienced are the ones who pull and carry others who are weak in the church. So what would being the church look like for you in your home, in your classroom, in your office, and in your laboratory, in your dorm? With those who watch you, Find reasons to want to surrender their lives to Christ. How do, we, <clears throat> how do we live in the coronavirus world? By remembering and by practicing and by being the church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you <clears throat> for reminding us, not just saving us, but, but from what kind of situation and status do, that you have chosen to save us and deliver us from. And we thank you. So Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, cause us to remember and help us to become intentional and deliberate about reflecting on and, and meditating on all the grace and mercy that we have received while we were your enemies and separated from you that you have entered into our world and saved us and made the gospel understandable and acceptable to us for causing us to yield to your spirit and yield to your call to surrender our lives to you. So Father, we pray as we remember, cause us to 
May Jesus be the center of our being and help us to transition from theoretical followers of Christ to actually practicing and living out in your presence that we know that you are with us, that you are doing life together with us, that you are immensely interested in our, in our life. Father, help us, please, to live our daily life representing you as ambassadors and as child of God Most High. And help us, grant us wisdom and courage to live our daily lives in your presence as our Father. And most of all, Father, we know that you have wonderful plans for every single one of us to be the kind of church that, that Jesus gave up his life in order to purchase. So, Father, we ask by the Holy Spirit and by the power of your word, help us to be the church for such a time as this. As, as the uncertainty and the fear is just spreading across the world. And we know that uh, the, the economic and, and uh, the devastation is, is yet to come. And people are concerned. And we are concerned. But knowing, Father, that you reign over even this situation, we pray that you would grant us wisdom and courage to choose to follow you and obey you. Help us to do this. Help us to be the church that you want us to be. And Father, we know that our obedience is something that you, you are looking from us. And as we continue to strive, oh Father, we pray that you would unleash your most gentle and powerful Holy Spirit for us to surrender our life one decision, one choice at a time, and help us to be the very church that you, you are looking for in such time as this. And once again, we thank you for meeting us and receiving our worship. We love you, Lord, and we surrender all of our prayers in the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, friends. <clears throat> um, as many of you know, that um, uh, um, a couple of quick announcements. Number one is that online offering. We have the information on the slide that you have received, and if you could, um, uh, if you consider SNU International Church part of your church, uh, your donation and your offering would would help us to continue to to um, uh, build this church to be strong and and have its presence. Um, affect change for many international students coming to SNU. And second thing, it's just a quick reminder that iGathering is continuing on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays. And we are studying through the book of Ephesians. And we'll be starting uh, with chapter 3 on Monday. So those of you who are um, really role models in your class, I know that you do uh, pre-course assignments faithfully and if you reflect and start just meditating on chapter 3 uh, it would help uh, everyone's corporate learning experience so if you could do that that would be fantastic okay and um, 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 so again we thank you for joining us for worship and uh, let's close in uh, with a word of prayer and benediction Father, once again, we thank you. We thank you for everything that you have done and you are currently doing. As, as we come together to bring our fears and anxieties and uncertainties about the future and um, this paralyzing fear that, that all of us have deeply lodged inside of us. Father, how are we going to overcome this pandemic crisis? And who will protect and safeguard our family members? And these are concerns, real concerns that we have. So, Father, we surrender them to you. And we are going to remember it is by grace that you have saved us. So cause us to remember and put into practice 
so that we could be the church you want us to be. <coughs> and Father, thank you for <coughs> choosing us. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and perfect eternal love of the Father and the ministry of the Holy Spirit who chooses people like us to become the conduit of your blessing and carrier of the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that you want to reach and establish relationship with. Father, use us and use our obedience to bring about your church and enlarge your kingdom from this moment on forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>